Hey guys, today I'll show you a horror thriller TV series named American Horror Story Season 11, New York City. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The drama is set against the backdrop of New York in 1981, with a focus on the LGBT community at the time. Police officer Patrick arrives at a crime scene where the appearance of a headless male corpse incites fear among the gay men who frequent the area. Indications from the victim's iconic leather pants and a matchbook from the Brownstone Bar, a well-known gay venue found in his pocket, suggest that he was part of the LGBT community. Meanwhile, in downtown Manhattan, a sanitation worker discovers a severed male head while cleaning the sewers. However, due to severe damage to both the body and the head, it is not yet possible to determine if they belong to the same person. At this moment, the coroner makes a startling discovery, a suspicious dark blue handkerchief inside the mouth of the head. From her experience, the handkerchief was likely placed there after death, and she notes that such handkerchiefs are often used as a symbol for certain sexual fetishes. The scene shifts to another part of New York, where Dr. Hannah on Fire Island discovers a new type of virus inside the body of a deer that died under mysterious circumstances. It's worth mentioning that Fire Island, a relatively secluded and special island located to the east of New York and close to the city, was practically a paradise for the LGBT community at the time. According to Dr. Hannah's research and description, this new virus mutates incredibly quickly and causes symptoms such as convulsions, skin infections, and liver failure when it's active. Hannah's colleague also expresses that this dangerous virus must be reported immediately as there is a high risk of it causing an outbreak and potentially infecting humans. Subsequently, Hannah reports the situation to the local sheriff, who decides that all deer on Fire Island must be culled immediately. At a gay newspaper office in New York, three lesbians approached Gino, the chief editor, with a friendly demeanor. They inquired why most of the articles seemed to favor gay men while neglecting lesbians. Gino candidly responded that as a gay man himself, his writing naturally tends to focus more on homosexual males. This statement prompted Fran, a leading figure in the lesbian group, to amiably remind Gino with a knife that he should consider featuring more articles about lesbians in the future. She then coolly walked away. That evening, Gino returned home to his partner Patrick, the closeted gay police officer mentioned earlier. The two discussed the day's discovery of the headless body, but their opinions were divided. Gino, upon learning about the incident and considering it was the third body found recently, questioned why the police hadn't released any information to the public. But Patrick cautioned Gino against such action. While Gino wanted to protect the LGBT community, Patrick preferred to keep the matter under wraps due to his profession and status as a closeted gay man. This led to a heated argument between the two, ending in an unhappy separation. Meanwhile, young Adam, who had just experienced a breakup, went to a gay hangout in Central Park at the invitation of his roommate. No sooner had they arrived than his roommate found his true love, leaving Adam on his own. Adam, feeling shy and abandoned, sat on a park bench waiting for his friend. As time passed, the streets emptied and there was no sign of his roommate. Adam began calling out for his friend, and at that moment, a muscular man wearing a leather mask started to approach him. The intimidated Adam quickly ran away, shouting for his roommate. Hearing Adam's cries for help, the roommate began to search for him, but suddenly, the muscular man materialized behind the roommate. On Adam's end, all he heard was his friend's scream before he could no longer find him. The following day, Adam went to the police station to file a report, and coincidentally, the case was taken by Officer Patrick. After a brief questioning, Adam became frustrated with Patrick's dismissive attitude, loudly accusing him of not caring about the LGBT community. Patrick tried to explain that it wasn't that he didn't want to help. It was just that Adam's roommate had only been missing for 12 hours, and the police couldn't yet be sure that he was in danger. For now, Adam was advised to return home and wait to see if his roommate would come back. As night fell once again, Adam found himself at Neptune's, a famous LGBT bathhouse in New York, discussing his missing friend. Coincidentally, editor Gino was there too. During the conversation, Adam suddenly noticed a photograph on the wall of a man who looked exactly like the muscular man from the previous night. He asked the attendant if he knew who the man in the photo was. The attendant didn't recognize the man, but knew the photographer who took the picture, who happened to be at the bathhouse at that moment. So, he pointed the photographer out to Adam. Adam wanted to find the photographer right away, but it was too late. The photographer had just found a companion and left the premises, casting a glance back at Adam. 
Meanwhile, Gino approached Adam, having overheard the conversation about his roommate's disappearance. He revealed his identity as a journalist and offered his help, leaving his contact information with Adam. The next day, Adam visited the photographer's studio. After exchanging pleasantries, the photographer introduced himself as Theo. He shared an intriguing aspect of his background. His grandmother was a Haitian witch who could see things others couldn't, and she always said that Theo inherited her abilities. Theo suggested that if Adam had questions, he should ask him while being photographed, and a shy Adam complied. Adam inquired about the muscular man, and Theo said that he didn't know the man's real name but his iconic muscles, and people called him Big Daddy. Importantly, Theo hadn't seen Big Daddy for several years. Their conversation was cut short by someone's arrival, so Adam left his contact information, hoping Theo would inform him if Big Daddy was spotted again. As Adam left, Theo's boyfriend and agent, Sam, entered. From their interaction, it was clear that Sam was arrogant and lived a lavish life with Theo. After some affectionate exchange, Theo expressed a sense that something terrible was happening, a feeling he attributed to the abilities inherited from his grandmother. However, the egotistical Sam dismissed Theo's concerns, showing no interest in his feelings and only talking about a new plan he had that could potentially make a lot of money. In the evening, Patrick returned home and asked to have a talk with an upset Gino. He mentioned that he had asked his superiors if he could share details of the ongoing case with a journalist, but his superiors firmly denied his request. Therefore, Patrick was unable to disclose any case details to Gino at this time. However, he was curious about the meaning of the dark blue handkerchief. Gino explained that in the gay community, the colors of handkerchiefs have special codes. If someone has a light blue handkerchief in their right pocket, it means they prefer performing oral massage on others, and if it's in the left pocket, it signals a preference for receiving it. A dark blue handkerchief in particular signifies the smelly hormone yoga between men. Upon understanding this, Patrick reiterated that he couldn't investigate the case at the moment, but suggested that Gino should look into the brownstone bar as a way to assist him. Gino then went to the Brownstone Bar and, after being tipped off by the bartender, he struck up a conversation with Henry, a regular there. When Gino mentioned he was investigating a serial killer, Henry recalled someone matching the description provided by Gino, noting this person usually came to the bar late and seemed to pay special attention to those who drank Mai Tai cocktails. Henry also remembered that once this person left the bar with someone, that individual was never seen again. At home, Patrick took out a mysterious box from his closet. Slowly, he opened the box and removed a partition, revealing a collection of handkerchiefs in various colors. After getting the information he wanted, Gino promptly left the bar. At the same time, in another part of the bar, Agent Sam was drinking with a budding actor, seemingly recruiting him for a new modeling plan. Using his influence and deception, he eventually convinced the newcomer to join his scheme. Just after leaving the bar, Gino started to feel dizzy, realizing that he might have been drugged. At that moment, a tall man appeared and pushed the disoriented Gino into his car. The budding actor who had just spoken with Sam followed Sam's directions and arrived at photographer Theo's studio. However, at the entrance of the studio, he encountered the masked muscle man known as Big Daddy. Strangely, Big Daddy stepped aside, allowing the budding actor to enter the studio. Inside, Theo began taking photographs while the agent Sam, caught up in his euphoria, complained that the photo shoot was too tame and unexciting. He then brought out a chair and lubricant, insisting that the budding actor strip naked to flex his chicken muscles for the photo. Under Sam's forceful demeanor, the budding actor complied. After the photo shoot, Sam told Theo he wanted to see the proofs when they were ready, expressing a desire to keep some photos for his private collection. Theo then asked his agent if he remembered Big Daddy, whom he had photographed in the past. But Sam suddenly became angry, stating that Big Daddy had been dead for years and was unwilling to talk further about it. After wrapping up the photo shoot, Theo made his way to the Neptune bathhouse once again. It was there that he ran into Adam and relayed the information he had heard. Big Daddy had died years ago. However, Adam remained adamant, insisting that the person he had seen was indeed Big Daddy, identical to the one in the photographs. At that moment, Theo, noticing a man nearby consumed by hormone desire, left with him without further ado. Soon after, the budding actor appeared, expressing a wish to get intimate with Adam, but Adam politely declined. Following this rejection, the budding actor headed to the sauna where Big Daddy was surprisingly present. Gino, who had been drugged, wakes up to the sound of a vacuum cleaner in a strange room. Tied up, he struggles to break free, but the man who kidnapped him injects him with a sedative once again. The kidnapper then heats a needle and thrusts it under Gino's fingernails, mumbling incoherently. 
However, as he begins to open Gino's shirt, he discovers a Marine Corps tattoo on Gino's body. The kidnapper immediately stops, and with an apology, he says that he can't let Gino serve his country a second time. He injects Gino with another dose of the sedative. Before releasing Gino, the man emphasizes that he's free to report to the police, but it wouldn't matter as the police wouldn't care about the incident, highlighting the significant discrimination against the LGBT community at the time. Once again, waking up in a strange place, Gino runs out to the streets, seemingly out of danger, but eventually collapses from weakness. Agent Sam visits Dr. Hannah's clinic, and according to her diagnosis, he has been infected with a parasite known as Cryptosporidium. The infection rates have been increasing recently. Typically, this parasite can be cleared by the human immune system, subtly indicating that there might be an issue with Sam's immunity. After Sam leaves, we see several familiar faces waiting for Dr. Hannah. Unlike Sam, they have come to the clinic because of strange blisters appearing on their bodies. Among the patients waiting is Whiteley, the man who had previously kidnapped Gino. Meanwhile, Adam found Gino and hoped that Gino could publish a photo of his missing roommate in the newspaper. Adam noticed Gino's injured fingers, and coupled with Gino's story about being kidnapped the night before, and then collapsing in the street until he was eventually rescued by two sisters, he realized that violence against the gay community was on the rise, and the police were indifferent. This realization made Adam understand that the world was unfriendly to their community, and they needed to use their own strength to help. So Adam suggested they set up a hotline to collect information currently detrimental to everyone and use the newspaper to spread the news. They began printing posters, plastering them all over the streets, and reporting Gino's ordeal, which was then published. From then on, the newspaper's phone wouldn't stop ringing. However, such high-profile actions, along with the conspicuous headlines, soon caught the attention of the authorities. At the same time, the three lesbians who had previously come to cause trouble found the chief editor Gino again, still wanting to increase the coverage of lesbian issues in Gino's newspaper. They continued in their sarcastically biting style until the beleaguered Gino had no choice but to propose that he was about to create a supplement. If they were willing, they could stay on as editors and write whatever they wanted. The lesbians happily agreed. Just as Gino stepped out of the newspaper office, Patrick's wife, Barbara, found him. Patrick was preparing for a divorce from his wife, who thought Patrick had too many secrets. She was aware of Patrick's same-sex partnership with Gino, and had approached Gino because she had found a very strange handkerchief while clearing out Patrick's things, which she thought was a kinky accessory between Patrick and Gino, so she delivered it to Gino. However, Gino showed no reaction to the handkerchief and simply left. The police felt that Adam's act of posting posters everywhere was a deliberate provocation. Although Officer Patrick tried hard to defuse the situation, the police still suddenly called in a muscular bruiser who gave Adam a rough time and then locked him up. Later, Patrick found Adam and told him that if Adam encountered any problems in the future, he should contact him and not to act so conspicuously again. Afterward, Adam's friend picked him up from the police station and persuaded Adam to go to a party that evening to unwind, especially since well-known figures from their social circle would be attending. However, on the subway to the party, Adam began to witness strange events. The lights in the subway suddenly went out, and a woman opposite him kept repeating that evil was about to descend. Upon arriving at the party, they found people dressed in very distinctive attire, the atmosphere vibrant with pulsating music, and cats visible everywhere, giving the party an artistic vibe. The host then took the stage, injected herself with some liquid and began to preach like a revivalist, exclaiming that evil was about to happen. She then pointed at Adam, indicating that someone was out to kill him. This scared the timid Adam so much that he ran away, bumping into the photographer Theo in the process. Theo quickly followed Adam, who angrily asked why Theo was flirting around even though he had a boyfriend, and questioned whether gay life had to be so promiscuous, or if there could be something more simple and pure. Theo's interest was piqued by this, and Adam suggested that they have a platonic date instead. In another scene, Gino returned home in silence, furious about being ignored by Patrick at the police station that morning. This also likely contributed to the conspicuous message on his posters to provoke the police, which also mixed in his indignation towards his boyfriend Patrick for not confronting his own inner feelings. Patrick, of course, noticed Gino's anger, so when Gino suggested they go to a gay bar together to investigate the case, Patrick readily agreed. Following clues related to the handkerchief, they ended up at a leather club. Unlike the unfazed veteran Gino, Patrick still seemed somewhat reserved. Meanwhile, at the bar on the other side, a chicken man suddenly received a Mai Tai sent by someone else, as explained by the bartender, but the person who sent the drink had disappeared. 
The chicken man was cautious and didn't touch the Mai Tai, ordering a beer for himself instead. Shortly after leaving the bar, a phone began to ring. Out of boredom, the man answered and heard the voice of the agent Sam, who invited him to an exclusive one-on-one -on -one party. Driven by curiosity, the chicken man decided to go find Sam. Back at the bar, Gino was talking to the manager who had seen Gino's ordeal in the newspaper and expressed that it was truly horrific. However, the manager quickly made it clear to Gino that he must not associate the bar with any of the reports. The bar owner's complicated ties with the mob meant they did not want any trouble. Gino assured that he would not drag the bar into the situation. After the manager left, a burly man approached Patrick to hit on him, which was met with a direct rejection. Later, Gino mentioned Barbara's visit earlier that day and started to feel that Patrick's numerous little secrets were becoming unbearable. He wanted to know what Patrick was really hiding. Meanwhile, the same burly man who had hit on Patrick earlier received a Mai Tai sent over by someone else. Unlike the cautious man before, he drank it without hesitation. Upon setting his glass down, he heard an eerie voice behind him. As he turned around, the man behind him suddenly stabbed the burly man in the neck and then left the scene. Gino and Patrick heard a scream and rushed over, but they found nothing except the Mai Tai next to the body. Meanwhile, Dr. Hannah was documenting her medical log. She explained that Whiteley, the man who kidnapped Gino and who had come in for treatment earlier that day, was diagnosed with Kaposi's sarcoma. However, the disease was previously more common in older adults. The phone rang. It was Fran, asking to meet Dr. Hannah in Central Park. She claimed to know what virus the current patients and the deer on Fire Island had contracted. Upon Dr. Hannah's arrival in Central Park, she saw a strange man approaching her with a chain. As she turned to flee, she bumped into Fran, who had just arrived, but the man with the chain had vanished. Dr. Hannah urgently asked Fran what she knew, and Fran explained that the virus appearing was actually an attack by the U.S. government on their vulnerable communities. The scene shifts back to Agent Sam, who returned home to find Big Daddy unexpectedly at his doorstep. However, it seemed that Sam couldn't see him. After Sam went inside, he headed to the basement, where the chicken man he had called on the phone yesterday was now caged up like a real chicken. The man pleaded for Sam to spare his chicken life, but Sam insinuated that since the man had come from an SM club and answered the phone, he must enjoy the sick games. Picking up a metal rod from the table, Sam approached, urging his big baby to begin their sick games. At 4 a.m., Patrick was jolted awake, and at the same time, Gino was sitting in the living room, unable to sleep. It seems that the previous night's murder had left them both restless. Gino expressed his dismay, saying someone had died right before their eyes. According to Patrick, the Mai Tai at the crime scene was not drugged. The only clue was a paper umbrella found next to the body. Gino, however, was more concerned about the secrets Patrick was keeping than the murder itself. At that moment, the phone rang. It was the police station. Subsequently, Officer Patrick rushed off to another crime scene where he discovered six severed hands, each belonging to different individuals hanging from a chain. The scene shifts to Dr. Hannah, whose investigation on the virus takes a twist as Fran begins to provide new clues about the unknown virus. After meeting with Fran, the two women go to a restaurant. It turns out that Fran was once an assistant in a secret lab and had participated in an experiment known as Operation Paperclip in 1952, a clandestine U.S. project that employed Nazi scientists to gain an advantage over the Russians. The scientists intended to hybridize animal and human diseases to develop a new type of biological weapon, and the experiments took place on Plum Island, not far from Fire Island. Fran recently heard that the U.S. government had restarted these secret experiments using ticks to spread diseases, which accidentally led to the virus spreading beyond Plum Island. In the end, Fran urges Dr. Hannah to gather evidence and expose the truth, as the government has begun to take notice of her, placing her in significant danger. The scene then shifts back to the chicken man who had been tormented by Sam suddenly awoke. Finding the cage unlocked, the chicken man quickly made his escape. But as he opened the door, he was met with the sight of Big Daddy standing at the entrance. The man pleaded for some chicken mercy, yet Big Daddy seemed unresponsive to his chicken voice. Despite this, the chicken man managed to get away and headed straight to the police station where he encountered Officer Patrick. After some questioning, Patrick learned about the situation and interrupted Sam's party to confront him. Sam was unfazed and claimed that the chicken man had consented to their chicken games and even enjoyed them. He was confident that the chicken man wouldn't press charges against him, as such matters are usually kept private. Sam then sidled up to Patrick and insinuated that if Patrick wanted to avoid complications, he should stay out of it, hinting that he knew Patrick was also gay. Not wanting to get his status exposed before his colleagues, Patrick had to leave the scene. 
Later that evening, back at home, Gino mentioned he had found an artist to sketch the kidnapper's face using the faint memories he had from his abduction. However, Patrick dismissed the effort as Gino had been sedated at the time. This lack of trust sparked an argument, exacerbated by the secret about Patrick that Gino had learned from Patrick's wife. In the heat of the moment, Patrick admitted to his interest in BDSM and his past visits to leather bars, which explained the presence of the handkerchiefs. He hadn't shared this with Gino because he found keeping secrets thrilling. Seizing the moment, Gino persuaded Patrick that investigating the case without permission could be just as exhilarating. So with Gino's encouragement, Patrick staked out a phone booth outside the bar, waiting for the kidnapper's call. After fielding calls from random men looking for a hookup and some pranksters, Patrick was about to give up when a mysterious call came through. The caller revealed that he had been watching Patrick at the bar entrance. From the switched scenes and voice, it was clear that this caller was Whiteley, the kidnapper of Gino. Following the caller's instructions, Patrick headed to the warehouse bar, scanning the crowd for the man he had been speaking to. Before long, Patrick identified a suspect, and another man also noticed him. The two ended up in a deserted alley. The voice didn't match the one on the phone, but Patrick found himself drawn in by the stranger's provocative behavior, leading to an intense physical encounter. On the other side, the clown patient who showed up at Dr. Hanna's clinic earlier took the subway home. His mysterious blisters were getting worse. While waiting for the train, he encountered the same madwoman. She cryptically told him that something was coming for him before turning and walking away. The clown patient, not quite understanding, followed her. The next day, Gino began his search for the perpetrator. He first approached Adam, hoping he could help distribute posters with the killer's likeness that Gino had drawn. Adam immediately realized the person was definitely not Big Daddy and became aware that there were now two killers on the loose. Adam mentioned his date with Theo, prompting Gino to warn him about Theo's boyfriend, Sam, a very dangerous man, and advised Adam to be cautious. Later, Gino took the poster to the leather bar, inquiring if the bar manager had seen the killer. The manager confirmed that the person had been at the bar the night of the incident. Gino insisted that they needed to publicize this information immediately, saying that the killer should make the newspaper's front page. Gino obtained permission from the manager to post the wanted poster in the bar. He then found the bar regular Henry, who acknowledged he knew the person and that he had been there the previous night. However, he didn't want to get involved and thus hadn't called the police at that time. Gino brought up his last visit to the bar, how he was taken away after drinking something Henry gave him last time. Henry immediately disclaimed any involvement. Seeing that Henry was unwilling to help, Gino left the poster and departed. Meanwhile, Patrick, after his previous physical encounter with the stranger man, found his secret desires resurfacing. He dressed in his fetish gear and began to fantasize, but suddenly noticed strange blisters appearing on his body as well. Meanwhile, on the other side of town, Adam was actively helping Gino search for the murderer. He went to the upscale private club where he was meeting Theo, and he didn't forget to ask the club owner for any news on the killer. Soon after, Theo arrived at the club, but Big Daddy appeared right behind him. After Theo sat down, he ordered beers for them both. Adam didn't understand why Theo would want to meet him when he already had a boyfriend, something Adam was looking for but clearly couldn't get from Theo. Their conversation shifted back to Big Daddy, with Adam insisting that Big Daddy was still alive. He had a hunch that Theo's boyfriend Sam must know something about Big Daddy. Theo seemed a bit persuaded by Adam's insistence, indicating that if Sam had any connection to Big Daddy, he would definitely find out. Suddenly, a Mai Tai arrived in front of Adam, sent over from Whiteley, who was at a distance. More importantly, the club owner realized that someone had locked the bar from the outside. Theo managed to force open the first door, but then Big Daddy threw a Molotov cocktail into the bar and locked the main door from the outside again. In the hospital, Dr. Hannah proposed to her superior the idea of discreetly collecting blood from male patients for virus research, but she was refused on the grounds of policy issues. Preparing to leave, Dr. Hannah suddenly saw the people who had been burned in the bar fire. Upon hearing it was a gay bar that caught fire, she returned to the hospital, intent on secretly obtaining blood samples. Meanwhile, in the hospital, Adam realized that the Mai Tai he received before the fire was from the bar killer. Since nobody was able to escape due to the fire, the killer had to be somewhere in the hospital. He grew more agitated as he spoke, but having inhaled too much smoke, he was forcibly restrained to the bed by doctors. In the end, Adam urged Theo to inform Gino about the situation. 
Theo rushed to make the call, and on the way, he encountered the club owner, who ominously told him that a big fire was coming. As soon as Gino was notified by Theo, he rushed to the hospital with Patrick. After listening to Adam's description, Gino immediately showed the nurses the poster, asking where this person was. However, when they reached Whiteley's room, they found out that Whiteley had just left, prompting the two to split up and search for Whiteley's whereabouts. At the same time, Dr. Hannah came to Adam's room, having discovered that Adam was admitted due to the bar fire. She secretly took a sample of his blood. Later, Hannah also found Whiteley and took his blood as well. Gino continued his relentless search for Whiteley. Soon after, the two encountered each other. Whiteley immediately ran away. The chase ensued until they ended up in the hospital's morgue. While Gino was checking the bodies for Whiteley, he was suddenly attacked from behind and knocked unconscious. When Gino awoke, he found himself tied up and was then shoved into one of the morgue drawers. Meanwhile, Patrick, who was also searching for the murderer, spotted Whiteley, who provocatively taunted him before fleeing. Patrick hurriedly pursued, but it was too late, and the killer escaped once again. At this point, Patrick realized that something might have happened to Gino. He retraced Whiteley's steps and began his search for Gino. Perhaps due to a couple's intuition, Patrick eventually found Gino in the morgue drawer, nearly frozen to death. The next day, Gino suddenly felt infested with fleas and deduced from the blisters on Patrick's body that Patrick must have transmitted them to him. However, since there were no other unusual symptoms, he didn't make much of it. Just then, the radio broadcast the day's weather report, announcing it would be the hottest day of the year. Later, Gino met with Adam at the newspaper office. After the previous intense encounter at the police station, Adam seemed more subdued. Using the pretext of having a friend involved, he wrote an article about the previous arson case. After reading it, Gino suggested that Adam should be brave and come forward and stop being a coward. Their community needed to make some noise now. Afterwards, Gino met with the owner of Neptune Baths, who was interviewing a new resident singer, her superfan who bore a striking resemblance to her. After the interview, Gino stated his purpose. The owner finally agreed to speak out in the newspaper. It turned out she had long realized that fewer people were coming to the baths, and she deeply cared about the LGBT community. In the end, she called on the police to pay more attention to minority groups, hoping to prevent further tragedies. On the other side of town, Patrick once again arrived at a crime scene, this time at the home of the clown patient who had been dead in his home for several days before his body was discovered by a friend. The corpse was already severely decomposed, and with the recent heat wave, even the coroner couldn't determine the exact time or cause of death. However, the coroner found the pustules on the body to be very peculiar. The clown seemed to have died from some virus infection rather than falling victim to a killer. The rest of the details would have to wait until the lab results were in. Patrick made an excuse to stay behind, and once everyone had left, he quickly called Gino to inform him of the situation. Gino planned to publish the news of the clown patient's death in the newspaper. At that time, Adam learned through the radio that due to an overloaded power grid, a widespread power outage was likely to occur. The news of the power outage, combined with the clown patient's unexpected death, caused Gino's emotions to become unstable. This was in light of Adam's recently published article about the bar tragedy under a pseudonym in the newspaper. Gino loudly criticized Adam, wondering why he hadn't yet taken a stand. But secretly, Gino was more worried that Adam might meet with misfortune before he had the chance to do so. Theo, who had experienced the bar fire the night before, returned to the apartment he shared with Sam. Theo had begun to suspect Sam's involvement in the recent spate of murders. Moreover, he was growing tired of their open relationship. He now desired a simpler romance, and Adam seemed to be the perfect candidate to change his life. On the other hand, Sam had sensed that Theo wanted to break up with him, which made him angry. In his eyes, he had given Theo everything he now had, and yet it was Theo who was initiating the breakup. After being together for so long, Theo was ready to suspect Sam of being a psychopathic killer based on just a few words from an outsider. In a fit of anger, Sam picked up the phone and urged Theo to call the police to confess what he believed to be his own heinous acts. However, Theo ultimately put down the phone, left the apartment keys, and walked out on Sam. On the other side, Adam was preparing to head home, but it seemed that someone had set their sights on him. Upon his return, he was surprised to find Theo waiting for him downstairs. Theo broke the news to Adam that he wanted to end his relationship with Sam. From Adam's response, it appeared he was ready to accept a romantic relationship with Theo. 
Afterward, Adam saw Theo off, and just as he got back home, the power went out. At that moment, his phone rang with an invitation from a friend to attend a very special party at the warehouse bar. Meanwhile, the sheriff approached Patrick. Having seen the news of the clown patient's death published in the newspaper by Gino, the sheriff began to suspect that Patrick had leaked the information. In a bold move, Patrick revealed to the sheriff that he was gay, and affirming that his sexual orientation would not stop him from continuing his investigation into the case. It was at this moment that the police station also experienced a power outage. After his revelation, Patrick received a chilling call from the psycho killer, Whiteley. Whiteley taunted Patrick, declaring his intention to go on a killing spree during the blackout. When Patrick inquired why Whiteley targeted gay men, Whiteley suggested that people only learn to cherish life after they have lost it. Whiteley left a clue before hanging up, prompting Patrick to head to Central Park in New York City. Elsewhere, Adam, who was about to go to the warehouse bar, was suddenly stopped by Sam's car. It's possible that Sam was the one secretly watching Adam in the afternoon. Sam bluntly asked Adam how much money it would take for him to give up Theo. Adam, of course, would not give up his true love. In the end, Sam could only threaten Adam once more, suggesting that Adam was just a new sweet treat for Theo to try when he was bored, and that Theo would surely return to him eventually. Patrick and his colleague arrived at Central Park, where Patrick got out of the car alone to search for Whiteley. However, as he was searching, Big Daddy appeared behind him to flex his muscles, wielding a meteor hammer. Big Daddy had previously used a chain and a Molotov cocktail, and now he had a meteor hammer, showing a real variety in his collections. Then, Big Daddy repeatedly attacked Patrick, who urgently called for backup, but his radio only emitted static. Big Daddy kept eerily reappearing behind Patrick until he shot at Big Daddy's bulletproof muscles. After the gunfire, Big Daddy suddenly disappeared. When Patrick's colleague arrived, there was no sign of Big Daddy anymore. Meanwhile, the guy who discovered the clown patient's body arrived at the warehouse bar where a lascivious party was in full swing. Wielding a flashlight, he kept warning everyone to stop the party since this place wasn't safe. At first, no one took him seriously, but when the news of the clown patient's death spread, it immediately captured everyone's attention. At this moment, Adam also arrived and informed everyone of the dire situation. Not only was there a serial killer on the loose, but there were also mysterious deaths occurring one after another. On the other side of town, after Patrick got home, he told Gino about his sexuality revelation at the police station. However, Gino seemed less than pleased. It turned out that Patrick's wife, Barbara, had once again approached Gino and produced a strange hood identical to Big Daddy's, attempting to brainwash Gino into maintaining his suspicions of Patrick. Confronted with the hood, Gino demanded answers from Patrick. Under pressure, Patrick insisted that although he had many one-night stands in the past, Gino was now his only one that he wanted to be with forever. However, Gino now saw Patrick as a habitual liar and had completely lost trust in him. As Gino grew more agitated, he suddenly felt a sharp pain in his heart and collapsed. Patrick rushed Gino to the hospital and stayed by his side until he awoke. The doctor explained that Gino's high fever was likely caused by a bacterial infection, and they found an enlarged lymph node in his armpit, along with flea bites on his body. It's important to clarify that swollen lymph nodes and fever are symptoms that can occur when the HIV virus enters the body. Upon hearing all of this, Gino turned his head away, unwilling to engage with Patrick any further. Meanwhile, after ending their raunchy party, two friends of the clown patient were crossing Central Park on their way home. They suddenly witnessed Whiteley committing a crime. Recognizing him as the person featured on recent flyers, the duo decided to follow Whiteley with the intention of reporting his residence to the police. They trailed Whiteley to an apartment building, but it seemed Whiteley had already sensed he was being followed and was luring them into a trap. The two joined Whiteley in an elevator, but just as it began to move, a power outage struck. Forced to feign calm, their facade didn't last long as Whiteley drew a knife. The scene shifts to the former lab assistant, Fran, who was buying fruit when she stumbled upon a psychic reader with a Help Wanted sign on the door. In need of a job, she decided to give it a shot. To her surprise, the owner turned out to be Kathy, the same woman who runs the Neptune Baths. Learning about Fran's job hunt, Kathy, short-staffed, hired her on the spot. Kathy reasoned that although Fran didn't know anything about being a psychic, the profession was anyway a mix of guesswork and deception. In these troubled times, simply giving people a bit of optimistic reassurance was enough. Thus, Kathy handed Fran an employment form and a tarot card guidebook, asking her to start the following evening. 
Fran went home, studied the guidebook, and shared the news of her new job with her girlfriend, who had been visiting Dr. Hannah's clinic to check on her worsening blisters. Late into the night, Fran was jolted awake by police sirens outside her window. She went to see what was happening, and once again, Big Daddy appeared mysteriously. On the following day, Fran reported for her first shift at the Psychic Reader. Her very first customer was none other than Dr. Hannah, accompanied by Adam. In an astonishing turn of events, it was revealed that Hannah was pregnant with Adam's child. As it turns out, Adam was her sperm donor. This revelation made sense of their previous encounter and acquaintance at the hospital. While they were discussing the future gender of their child, they happened to pass by the psychic reader and decided to have a little fun with a tarot reading. When Dr. Hannah walked into the club and saw Fran, she was taken aback because Fran seriously discussed conspiracy theories to her several days ago, and now she had transformed into a tarot card master. This rapid shift in roles made Hannah suspicious, but Fran assured her that her previous claims about Plum Island were absolutely true. From their ensuing conversation, it was evident that despite being a novice fortune teller, Fran was quite skilled in her delivery. After persuading Hannah and Adam to have a reading, it was Adam's turn first. He wanted to know if his missing friend was still alive. The first card revealed was the death card. Fran hastened to explain that the death card doesn't necessarily signify actual death, but Adam, unsettled by the card, decided he was done and tossed the cards aside. Next up was Hannah, who wanted to know if she was expecting a boy or a girl. However, as her cards were turned over, three death cards appeared, which was impossible since a standard deck contains only one death card. As Hannah was visibly shaken and Adam was angered, he scattered the remaining cards onto the floor, only to find that they had all turned into death cards. Horrified, Hannah and Adam made a quick exit from the club, but after their departure, the cards mysteriously returned to their normal state. The next day, Patrick and his wife Barbara were getting ready to sign the formal divorce agreement. It was apparent that Barbara was not in her best health, as she seemed somewhat absent-minded. Just as they were about to sign, Barbara once again sent the lawyers away and made another attempt to hold on to Patrick. However, Patrick's mind was made up and he rejected his wife's plea. With no other option, Barbara proceeded to sign the divorce papers, but immediately after doing so, she collapsed to the floor. After she woke up in the hospital, it seemed there were no serious problems, but rather than worrying about her own health, she was more concerned about her dog, who hadn't eaten anything at home all day. So Patrick hurried to his wife's house to check on the dog. But when he entered the house, he noticed the lights seemed to be out of order, and the dog was frantically barking at the closet door. An eerie sight indeed. Then, strange noises emerged from the closet. On high alert, Patrick drew his gun and approached the closet slowly. However, as he opened the door, Big Daddy suddenly appeared to flex his big muscles and began to attack Patrick. During the scuffle, Big Daddy even attempted to unbuckle Patrick's smelly pants, intending to check his birdies. Sensing imminent danger, Patrick fought back, but he was eventually knocked unconscious. When he awoke, he called the police immediately. Meanwhile, Adam was at the hospital accompanying Hannah, who was getting a pregnancy checkup. Upon arriving at the hospital, he brushed past the serial killer whitely without recognizing him. Later, when Adam saw Hannah, she mentioned having a nightmare about giving birth to something with many tentacles, prompting her to get checked out. Adam thought it was all due to the influence of the tarot cards. After the doctors came back with the test results, they noted that Hannah's red blood cell count was low, suggesting anemia. After the doctor left, Hannah suddenly shared that she had drawn blood from the injured at the bar fire and found that nearly everyone exhibited low red blood cell counts, including Adam. She was puzzled as to why she was also showing these symptoms. On the other side, Patrick accompanied his wife Barbara back home, where the previously broken lights had suddenly started working again. Although Patrick didn't want his wife to stay in the house for safety reasons, she insisted on staying. After all, the police had searched the entire building since the incident, and a patrol car was stationed outside the building 24 hours a day. Meanwhile, Adam met up with Theo and relayed what Dr. Hannah had said about everyone's low red blood cell count. The couple, sweetly wrapped up in each other, didn't take it seriously. Then Theo announced he had a surprise for Adam and pulled him to the psychic reader. It turns out Theo had heard about Adam and Hannah's previous tarot reading, and intrigued by the thrill, he wanted to try it out for himself to see what the future held for him and Adam. Left with no choice, Adam once again stepped into the club. After everyone had taken their seats, the ceremony began. This time, after Adam and Theo had cut the deck, the first card to appear was the Judgment card. Fran explained that this card represented self-reflection and was a good card to draw. The second card revealed was the Devil card, which Fran described as mischievous and fun, symbolizing a sense of questioning. 
The third card turned over was the death card, but just as it was flipped, the table suddenly began to shake. Startled, Adam asked who was going to die. At that moment, Fran's voice changed as if she was possessed, and she eerily said it's him, which gave Adam quite a scare. After the shaking stopped, Fran seemed to snap out of her trance, suggesting the vibration was merely due to the subway passing by. Regarding the strange voice earlier, both Fran and Theo claimed they heard nothing. A frightened Adam promptly ran out, with Theo quickly following behind. Later, Adam returned to the newsroom and told Gino about finding Fran for a part-time job, as well as his two bizarre experiences. Finally, he coaxed Gino to go and have a first-hand experience. So, Gino also went to the psychic reader, where the owner Kathy happened to be present. Kathy started by praising Fran, but Gino saw right through it. The cunning Kathy then managed to get Gino to sit down, and this time she personally did a reading for him. Following Gino's cut of the deck, the judgment, devil, and death cards appeared in the same order as they had for Adam. Kathy thought there must be some mistake and suggested starting over, this time having Gino shuffle the cards himself. However, when the three cards were turned over again, they were still the judgment, devil, and death with no change. Suddenly, the lights in the room dimmed and white smoke began to appear around them. Behind Kathy, a sinister figure with slowly unfurling wings emerged. It was the Death Angel, who pointed out Gino's inner fears and timidity while slowly approaching him. She then said she wanted to kiss Gino, which caused him to shout no abruptly. He then stood up, and as Gino continued to shout, the Death Angel suddenly vanished. In the end, only a confused Kathy was left, along with the death card on the table. In the evening, Gino returned home to freshen up. The episode used cross-cutting to show both Gino and Barbara taking showers simultaneously. They each encountered the appearance of Big Daddy, but with different outcomes. It seems that Big Daddy here in this show was a symbol of death, who might be protecting the minority groups. After his shower, Gino discovered unexplained growths on his body, which seemed to be Kaposi's sarcoma. On the other hand, Barbara imagined Patrick protecting her as she bathed. However, in the next moment, Big Daddy appeared behind her and killed her instantly. Hearing Barbara's chicken scream, Patrick rushed into the house, only to find her dead as a piece of soap. In a state of regret, he banged on the police car downstairs, but to no avail. Later, he sought comfort from Gino, and at that moment, Gino noticed that Patrick had developed growths similar to his own. The scene shifts to the cold-blooded killer, Whiteley. He had captured the two people who followed him. Facing his terrified captives, Whiteley murmured that he wasn't taking their lives, but giving them meaning, transforming them into something greater. He then showcased his new creation, a person assembled from different corpses. He revealed that his work was only missing two critical parts, a heart and a male-specific organ. Picking up a scalpel, he pondered which of his captives to start with, turning to Patrick and Gino, who found Dr. Hanna. They had heard that on the night of the bar fire, Dr. Hanna had collected blood samples from the injured patrons, including the killer Whiteley, who had also appeared at the hospital that night. They hoped to glean some information about Whiteley from her, However, no matter how much Patrick and Gino pressed her, Dr. Hannah, adhering to her medical ethics, refused to disclose any patient information. At the same time, Dr. Hannah noticed the growths on Gino's body and mentioned that she had seen similar symptoms in many gay men recently. She suggested that both men should get checked when they had the chance. Later, Patrick returned to the police station where a colleague approached him with a reminder. He pointed out that Patrick and Gino's visit to the hospital to inquire about the killer had resulted in a complaint from the hospital, which suspected that the police might think the killer was one of their own. This baseless suspicion infuriated Patrick, who sharply told his colleague to mind his own business. Then, Patrick's phone suddenly rang. It was a friend from Fire Island who had shockingly discovered an old corpse beneath them, wearing a black leather mask. Since other police officers were reluctant to deal with LGBT-related cases, the friend had no choice but to call Patrick, who was known within the community. Patrick's reaction was uncharacteristically immediate. He asked if anyone else had been told about this, and upon hearing they hadn't, he instructed his friend to keep it under wraps for now. Patrick then called Sam to inform him about the body's discovery, leaving Sam utterly shocked. Meanwhile, Henry was summoned to the park by a mysterious person who appeared to be associated with the police. The mysterious visitor sought out Henry because of the recent public discussions triggered by articles about the killer that Gino had published in the newspaper. Consequently, the higher-ups in the police force, eager to silence the questioning voices, hoped that Henry would help them get rid of Gino. After hanging up with Sam, Patrick returned home to pack his bags, preparing to head to Fire Island. 
Gino, perplexed by Patrick's sudden urgency, probed for an explanation. Patrick excused himself, claiming that a new lead on the Mai Tai killer had surfaced on the island. When Gino expressed his desire to accompany Patrick, he was firmly rejected, which only fueled Gino's suspicions. After Patrick left, Gino quickly followed and witnessed him getting into Sam's flashy car. Gino hurried back to pack his own gear, intent on following them to Fire Island to uncover the truth. However, Gino was stopped in his tracks when Henry unexpectedly showed up at his place. Gino had forgotten to lock the door in his rush earlier. After brief pleasantries, Henry pulled out a gun and warned Gino that the higher-ups were displeased with the reports he had been writing, which were causing unnecessary trouble. If Gino didn't cease his investigations, severe consequences would follow. Despite the threat, Gino persisted in arguing that Henry's actions were aiding the Mai Tai killer. Gino also revealed the news shared by Patrick about the killer's appearance on Fire Island, which immediately put Henry on high alert. Meanwhile, Patrick and Sam had arrived on Fire Island and met up with the friend who had called in the gruesome discovery. Dominating the conversation, Sam bluntly dismissed the younger folks, telling them to leave the rest to him. The two then arrived at Sam's villa on the island, a place he professed to deeply miss as it was his only sanctuary. But the nostalgia was cut short when he questioned Patrick why they had buried a body in such shallow sand. They proceeded to the beach, planning to exhume the discovered corpse and move it to a safer location. That's when Gino made an unexpected appearance. Henry had brought him after learning of the incident. Seeing the body, Gino demanded answers from Patrick. Initially, Patrick attempted to deflect, but faced with Gino's curiosity, he had no choice but to delve into his past. It turns out that in 1979, Officer Patrick visited Fire Island for the first time and was promptly hit on by Sam. They attended one of Sam's parties, where Patrick met a cute boy. During the party, amidst the indulgence in uninhibited revelry, Sam, Patrick, and the cute boy ended up in a room together for their intimacy. Before they started, Sam placed a black hood over the cute boy's head and positioned him on a metaphorical chopping block. However, in the midst of their chaotic encounter, Sam noticed something was wrong. Perhaps due to the substance, the cute boy had stopped breathing. The realization sobered up both Sam and Patrick. A drug-laden police officer and a high-profile agent couldn't afford to involve the police. Stuck in a dire situation, Sam had no choice but to call in Henry, a well-known trouble fixer in the community. Henry arrived with a professional cleaner, Whiteley, who at that time still possessed a certain innocence and compassion for the tragic loss of life. Yet this compassion was swiftly crushed under Henry's heavy-handed persuasion, and he threatened to expose Whiteley's sexuality to his family if he didn't comply. It appeared that even the cold-bloody killer Whiteley once had the innocence of youth. Meanwhile, unable to stomach the bloody scene, Patrick and Sam fled outside. On the other side, Whiteley skillfully laid out the plastic sheeting and took out his tools to begin processing the body. After he finished, Whiteley carefully admired his handiwork, remarking that it was truly beautiful and someone should have properly looked after the boy. Everyone knows what happened next. The body was buried in the sand in front of the villa. Back in the present, Gino felt overwhelmed after learning the whole story, but decided to help Patrick with the body. While digging up the corpse, Patrick noticed that the method used to dismember the body was identical to that of the Mai Tai killer, a technique he had never seen in all his years of police work, until this body turned up. Under pressure from Patrick and Gino, Henry finally revealed the cleaner's name that fateful night was Whiteley. Gino quickly mentioned that he had been kidnapped before and recognized the Mai Tai killer. He suggested that Henry take him to find Whiteley. Before leaving, Patrick handed his service weapon to Gino just in case. Gino and Henry then headed back to New York, planning to lure Whiteley out and have Gino confirm whether he was indeed the Mai Tai killer. Meanwhile, Whiteley had already taken care of the two who had been tracking him previously. However, during his conversation with Henry, he sensed something odd about Henry's sudden invitation, but ultimately agreed to meet. That evening, the two met outside the bar as agreed. Henry instructed Gino to hide in the back seat and wait for him to bring Whiteley out, then entered the bar alone. Whiteley had been waiting for a while, and when Henry sat down, he pushed aside the Mai Tai Whiteley had ordered for him and asked for a whiskey instead. This action revealed that Henry knew Whiteley was the Mai Tai killer. Before leaving, Whiteley said he needed to use the restroom. After waiting a bit, Henry sensed something was not right, looked at Gino in the car, took out his gun, and followed Whiteley into the bathroom. But being older, he was easily subdued by the military-trained Whiteley. Pretending to help an intoxicated Henry home, Whiteley carried him out of the bar and placed him in his car. Gino across the street quickly started his car to follow. 
After parking and seeing Whiteley carry Henry out of the car, Gino hurried to a phone booth to call Officer Patrick for help. Upon receiving Gino's plea, Patrick hurriedly made his way to Whiteley's warehouse, where Gino was already waiting for him. Gino asked Patrick why he hadn't brought police backup, to which Patrick responded that regular cops would definitely not handle this kind of situation. Then, taking his service weapon back, Patrick and Gino entered the warehouse. After a thorough search inside, they found Henry, who had fainted. At that moment, the machinery nearby started up. The sentinel that Whiteley had crafted from different victims once again sprang into action. As Patrick and Gino were taken aback by what they saw, Whiteley appeared behind them and effortlessly knocked them out. Later, Patrick regained consciousness, with the previous sentinel now lying next to him. Whiteley then approached and sat down beside Patrick, expressing a desire to have a one-on-one -on -one chat. It turned out that he was a devoted fan of Officer Patrick, admiring his integrity and his courage to stand up for their community. So Whiteley wanted to imbue his own creations with Patrick's heart, which he saw as kind and brave. While the Sentinel already had a heart, Whiteley was dissatisfied with the current one and believed Patrick's heart would be a better fit. With that, Whiteley turned around to prepare for the heart transplant. Meanwhile, Gino and Henry were tied up in another room. When Gino awoke, he began to shout for Patrick in fear, but Henry quickly silenced him. Henry reminded him that Patrick might be a bit too young for him, suggesting that Gino would be better suited to a more mature man. The pair then started to look for a way to escape. Henry managed to break his own right hand and free himself from the handcuffs. While searching for tools to unlock the other hand, a nearby saw caught his attention. After some contemplation, Henry acknowledged that their current predicament might be a just retribution for his past actions. He had long suspected that Whiteley, whom he had wronged in the past, was the Mai Tai killer, but Henry had never dared to admit it. His denial had led to the deaths of many of his kind. Now, it was time for Henry to make amends. With resolve, he picked up the saw and determinedly cut off his own hand. Meanwhile, Patrick was also searching for anything that could help him escape his predicament. He suddenly noticed a handgun next to the Sentinel and began to converse with Whiteley, questioning why the creation of Sentinels had to involve people from their own community. Whiteley explained that it had to be their own people to prove that no one cared about their group, that nobody was willing to deal with their issues, especially the police. Whiteley confessed that after replacing the heart, he planned to infuse the Sentinel with his own blood, combined with adrenaline and electric shocks, to ultimately bring the Sentinel back to life. This was his true plan. Whiteley then gagged Patrick again and took out the heart that was previously in the Sentinel. Just as he was about to operate on Patrick, Gino and Henry suddenly appeared. Gino, wielding a chainsaw, forced Whiteley to retreat, declaring that Whiteley would pay for his past actions. Whiteley claimed that he was doing something great that would change the world and how it treated minority groups. He said that pricking Gino's fingers wasn't torture but a test, and that when he killed, he gave the unused body parts to the police to show their incompetence and disregard for minority groups. Henry countered, asking Whiteley if he never felt pleasure from killing. Whiteley admitted he did feel pleasure, acknowledging it as a flaw and a part of himself that needed purifying. At that moment, Patrick chambered around in the handgun, stating that all of Whiteley needed to be purified. As Patrick prepared to shoot, he began to hallucinate, seeing all the victims Whiteley had killed standing behind him. Without hesitation, Patrick shot and killed Whiteley. The following day, the news of the death of the Mai Tai killer was published in Gino's newspaper. Alongside it, the story of how Officer Patrick had shot the Mai Tai killer also made the headlines. Suddenly, Patrick became the center of attention, but not for his casework. Instead, it was his identity as a gay man that everyone focused on. Upon entering his office the next day, Patrick discovered his desk vandalized with pink paint. Judging by his colleagues' mockery, it seemed to be an inside job from someone within the police force. Enraged, Patrick stormed into the sheriff's office, ready to hand in his badge and gun and resign. But he was stopped by the sheriff, who surprisingly changed his previous stance. This time, he affirmed Patrick's actions and acknowledged that there were indeed problematic behaviors among some officers in the precinct. The sheriff's praise, however, came with an ulterior motive. He wanted Patrick to help clean up the mess within the force and improve relations with LGBT communities. Patrick retorted by asking why the department didn't reopen cases involving minorities, especially those that had been harmed, discriminated against, or covered up by the police. After a dramatic turn, Patrick walked out, resigning from his job as a police officer. But before leaving for good, he had one last thing to do. 
He went down to the precinct lobby where Adam was waiting for him. It turned out that Adam had come to check on the body of his missing friend, which was the reason he got involved in the case in the first place. Though Patrick tried to prepare Adam emotionally, explaining that most of the bodies had been dismembered by Whiteley, Adam was still shocked when he saw the sentinel that Whiteley had created. But they couldn't find any part that belonged to Adam's missing friend. Later, Adam sought out Dr. Hannah, who had been studying the blood of gay men, including her own, after being diagnosed with anemia. She discovered that everyone, including herself, had affected platelets and T-cells. Alarmingly, half of the people displaying these symptoms had mysteriously disappeared, not at the hands of the Mai Tai killer, but through other means. Dr. Hannah then emphasized that Adam's missing friend was one of her earliest patients. Now, everyone was perplexed and wondered where Adam's friend had gone if he was not a victim of the Mai Tai killer. Later on, Hannah and Adam approached Fran and others, as Fran had once shared with them a conspiracy theory about a virus tested by the authorities. At this point, Hannah revealed that the affliction they were suffering from wasn't a disease per se. She and Adam were infected with a virus, while Fran's girlfriend had a bacterial infection, similar to the deer on Fire Island. They decided on a course of action to publicize the current situation in the newspapers to draw society's full attention. Adam then went to the newspaper office, where Gino shared that he had looked into Adam's missing friend who hadn't returned to his parents' home. Gino believed that the friend had fallen victim to the Mai Tai killer and that they just hadn't found the body yet. However, Adam disagreed, suggesting that there might still be another killer out there. Gino, who had been stressed by recent events, insisted that the killer cases had been solved and refused to let Adam report on the matter. Eventually, Gino mentioned that he and Patrick had rented a house on Fire Island and suggested that Adam should join them there to clear his mind. Meanwhile, upon leaving the police station, Patrick suddenly saw his deceased wife Barbara at the roadside. But after a car passed by, she vanished into thin air. That evening, Patrick returned home and shared the vision of Barbara with Gino. Despite being gay, Patrick had been married to Barbara for many years, and it was evident he still had feelings for her. Coupled with the unjust treatment he had received at the police station, Patrick was probably under immense psychological stress, leading to a near-emotional breakdown. This state of mind also affected Gino, but he continued to comfort Patrick, helping to stabilize his emotions. After returning home, Dr. Hannah felt nauseated due to her pregnancy and started vomiting. She then called Adam and left a message saying she couldn't make it to Fire Island. It seemed that after Adam decided to go to Fire Island, he had also invited Hannah. She excused herself, saying her pregnancy was too advanced for her to endure a long boat ride and declined Adam's invitation. However, after hanging up the phone, her expression clearly showed she was worried about something else. Then she called her mother, expressing how much she missed her and sharing her fear about a terrible virus that might have infected her. The virus was destroying her immune system, and her white blood cell count was alarmingly low. She wanted to move in with her mother for a while, and her mother happily agreed. But just at that moment, the ghost-like Big Daddy appeared again. That night, after comforting Patrick, Gino arrived at the newspaper office and taking Adam's advice, he decided to publish a new article. This time, the piece was about dignity, death, and the warnings the case of the Mai Tai killer Whiteley brought to the forefront. He questioned what had created the Mai Tai killer. Was it inherent human evil or the amplification of evil within them all due to societal inequalities toward minority groups? He then fantasized about whether the Sentinel created by Whiteley could bring benefits to minority groups if the Sentinel were to actually come to life. Ultimately, he called for society to let go of its preconceived notions about LGBT groups because only then can these groups possess true dignity. The scene shifts to Gino and Patrick, who are leading a group of lesbian sisters, along with Adam and Theo, on a vacation to Fire Island. However, Theo couldn't stop throwing up on the ferry to the island. At first, Adam just thought he was seasick until Theo revealed that he had been vomiting every day. This reminded Adam of Dr. Hannah's recent warnings about a virus that was spreading and could destroy the immune system, T-cells, and platelets. Meanwhile, Theo casually mentioned his own medical history, six bouts of gonorrhea, two cases of syphilis, and several chlamydia infections. Despite Theo's history of illnesses, he confessed that he had always longed for a steady boyfriend, and he was determined not to repeat his past mistakes in his relationship with Adam. Adam just chuckled and shook his head at the complexity of men. After everyone arrived on the island, Theo's ex-boyfriend Sam showed up at the dock, and right in front of Theo, he flirted with a new catch. This blatant provocation was just seen as bad luck in Theo's eyes. 
Later, Gino and Patrick went to the beach to enjoy some rare leisure time. However, when Patrick attempted to take their intimacy further and tried to remove Gino's clothes, Gino stopped him. It turned out that the number of nodules on Gino's body had inexplicably increased. He had hoped to forget about it on the trip, but his intuition told him that something was growing inside him. Patrick, on the other hand, thought Gino was overreacting and suggested they see a psychiatrist. This attitude made Gino explode, and he went off alone to clear his head. Elsewhere, Adam and Theo were discussing in their villa about going out for afternoon tea. Theo felt that a bit of alcohol might make him feel better, but Adam immediately retorted, asking if he could start hitting on other guys after a few drinks. At that moment, Patrick returned to the villa. Adam noticed something was off and approached to ask if something had happened between him and Gino. It was clear that Patrick didn't want to elaborate, but he did mention that Gino had always been feeling anxious, and he felt somewhat helpless. After Theo and Adam left for their afternoon tea, Patrick went to take a shower. It was then noticeable that he had also begun to develop nodules on his back. Suddenly, Patrick felt a presence in the villa. He rushed out to check and was startled to see his deceased wife standing outside. As Patrick moved closer to Barbara, she teleported behind him, repeatedly saying she had loved him. At that moment, something seemed off about Barbara's skin. As she went to kiss Patrick, she vanished into thin air. Meanwhile, strange things were happening with Gino as well. As he wandered around the island, Big Daddy seemed to be secretly watching him. Later, Gino went to the beach, and to his surprise, Henry appeared and suddenly confessed his feelings to Gino. No wonder he had said previously that Gino suited a more mature man. Henry found Gino's articles and his denim attire all very attractive. However, Gino wasn't interested at all. Henry continued, saying he had heard about the argument between Gino and Patrick, which gave him hope to make his move. Gino was surprised and asked how Henry knew about their fight. Henry explained that the higher-ups were still monitoring Gino's every move. Gino's indifferent response somehow impressed Henry, who thought Gino was really cool, almost like he was on a high and turned into a hopelessly smitten puppy. But Gino remained unmoved by the stalker's advances, which caused a sudden shift in Henry's demeanor. He shouted that he had helped Gino multiple times within the criminal syndicate and even spared his life, so Gino couldn't treat him this way. It was clear that Henry was really high on his emotions. He even knelt down, hoping Gino would accept him, but Gino still rejected Henry. Adam and Theo went out for afternoon tea. It was evident that Theo wasn't feeling well. At that moment, Sam appeared. Theo felt a bit awkward seeing his ex-boyfriend. On the other hand, Adam was lost in thoughts about how they would have a happy night and expressed a desire to try some fun with Theo. But Theo was uncomfortable and just wanted to go back and lie down for a while. So Adam hurried to settle the bill, ready to head back. Meanwhile, Sam caught sight of Henry outside and approached him. Henry admitted that he was there to pursue Gino, but felt insecure because of his hand injury. Sam then suggested that Henry should have some fun with other guys, instead of pining for just one person, and arranged to meet Henry in the woods that night. Later, Sam approached Theo to make amends. Theo, feeling unwell and not thinking much about it, readily accepted the reconciliation and drank the drink offered by Sam. The scene shifts to Fran, who came to Fire Island to be hired by a group of gay men to read tarot cards for them that night, and the pay was quite good. Her attentive girlfriend brought some sage, saying it would enhance the experience during the card reading. Meanwhile, their friend advised not to work too late into the night as they had an appointment with a new doctor the next day. According to this new doctor, she had encountered about 50 cases like Fran's girlfriend's just over the summer and was eager to meet Fran's girlfriend and learn about the latest research by Dr. Hannah. The friend mentioned they hadn't heard from Dr. Hannah lately. Just then, Fran's girlfriend heard strange noises outside. Going to the window, she saw Big Daddy. The friend joined her, and they both mocked Big Daddy's big muscles, thinking he was just a lost gay man. But in a moment, Big Daddy vanished like a ghost and reappeared in front of Fran's window. Fran mooed like a mad cow, recognizing him as the peeping Tom she had seen before. The group of lesbians became defensive, telling Big Daddy to get lost with his big muscles because they weren't interested in men. Fran's girlfriend even confronted him with a knife in hand. However, facing the girl, Big Daddy simply walked away. In the evening, Gino returned to the villa when Big Daddy suddenly appeared again, pushing him to the ground and gripping his throat. Gino quickly fought back, and the two of them scuffled together. At that moment, Adam arrived and joined the fray. Gino seized the opportunity to stab Big Daddy in the thigh, and then hurriedly escaped to another room with Adam. Adam shouted that this was the actual killer who had murdered his missing friend. Just then, Big Daddy burst through the door, but at this critical moment, Patrick fired his gun and took down Big Daddy. Afterwards, the trio discussed what to do next. 
Adam suggested they should take a look at Big Daddy's face to see who he really was, so they returned to where Big Daddy's body was, but the body had already disappeared like a ghost. On the other side, it turns out that it's Sam who had invited Fran for tarot reading. Fran then started reading tarot for various people. However, the readings turned out to be ominous. The death card appeared in her left hand and again in her right, leaving her a bit bewildered. Meanwhile, Henry arrived at the woods where he had agreed to meet Sam. After meeting up, Sam led Henry to a person tied up. It was Theo, who had just reconciled with him that afternoon. It turned out that Sam had drugged Theo's drink earlier in the day, anticipating his reaction, so now Theo was under the influence and not in his right mind. Sam explained to Henry that this was one of Theo's kinks and told him to enjoy before leaving the scene. Henry, upon hearing this, decided to dive right in. He began to undress and was about to take advantage of Theo when Big Daddy suddenly appeared behind him. Without a second thought, Henry grabbed his clothes and ran off. Then a puff of white smoke rose and Big Daddy disappeared once more. Hallucinations seemed to start appearing before Theo's eyes. Men with antler decorations began to emerge in the woods and slowly approached him. Theo recognized these men as models he had once photographed. The men then untied Theo and lifted him up, and at that moment, Theo showed an unprecedented look of satisfaction. Then, a beam of white light hit Theo's face, ending his life. It seems that the ghost-like figure Big Daddy is cleansing people related to the virus. The method of cleansing might be related to Theo's experience. The antlered individuals may have been those cleared by Big Daddy now serving under him. This could also explain why Barbara keeps reappearing after her death. The scene shifts to Theo's funeral. His friends had all gathered at the funeral. However, Patrick had resigned from the police force, so to date, the police hadn't released any information about the cause of death. In the midst of the funeral proceedings, Theo's ex-boyfriend Sam suddenly and inexplicably fainted, and in his haze, he too saw the familiar figure of Big Daddy. When Sam awoke, he found himself in a hospital bed, being cared for by the cute boy whom he and Patrick had supposedly played to death. Then the doctor came into the room, and to Sam's astonishment, it was Theo. Theo explained that Sam's immune system was on the brink of collapse, which had caused a severe case of pneumonia due to a fungal infection. Sam, unable to believe the absurdity before him, yelled out his desire to leave. But Theo told him that the hospital they were in was the only one willing to treat him. No other hospital would accept Sam. As they walked down the hospital corridor, Theo asked Sam if he remembered what he had mentioned about something that was coming. Theo revealed that this something was now present in the hospital. They entered a room filled with an unbearable stench, where a critically weak man lay in the bed. Theo said that this man had been admitted about a month earlier with the same virus that Sam had contracted, and he was the first person to join them in their open relationship, the first to be intimate with both of them. It seemed his infection was the result of sexual activity with Sam. Just then, the man in the bed lost control of his bowels, startling Sam into running out of the room. Theo then took Sam to another room where lay the chicken man, whom Sam had seduced over the phone. He too was infected with a mysterious illness and was extremely weak. Finally, Theo led Sam to the room he was about to be admitted to. Inside, there was already a patient. As Sam got closer, he realized in horror that it was himself gravely ill. Upon discovering this was a vision of his own abandoned future, Sam protested that it was impossible. He had many friends, many who loved him. He couldn't end up so pitiful in his later years. Desperate, Sam asked how he could be cured, but Theo replied there was no cure for this disease and virus. At that moment, the Sam in the bed began to convulse, while the other Sam screamed, wanting to do something to save himself. But just then, both Sams mysteriously vanished. The screen flashed, and Sam awoke once again inside a metal cage. Suddenly, Henry appeared beside him, announcing that he was about to play a little game with Sam. It was evident that Henry's cut-off hand had reappeared, suggesting another hallucinatory sequence. Henry picked up a toy, and while taunting Sam, criticized him for embodying the kind of extremism that fosters widespread misunderstandings about LGBT groups. He continued, explaining that unlike Sam, he never believed his own suffering was greater than anyone else's. As the light beside them turned on, a man was revealed, tied to an operating table. Henry handed the whip to a ghostly, muscular figure who began to lash the man on the table relentlessly. Henry instructed Sam to watch closely. The man being whipped was Sam's father. It seemed that the scene was an exposition of Sam's fetish rooted in childhood abuse from his father. The scene shifted once again, revealing another bound man. It's Sam's first boss after he started working. 
Sam explained how he was never given the recognition he deserved, which is why he left his previous industry to become a collector, gathering various men and money to earn the respect he never received. Then another man appeared, bound. It was Sam himself. The muscular figure removed his hood to reveal he was actually Big Daddy. As Sam struggled, the scene shifted yet again, this time to the sandy beaches of Fire Island with Big Daddy emerging and chasing after Sam. When he caught Sam, Henry declared that all they can do is surpass themselves. Hearing this, Big Daddy released Sam, and in the distance, many telling-tailed deer appeared. Sam turned back, stunned to see Big Daddy, then mustered the courage to remove Big Daddy's mask. They embraced and kissed each other under the watchful eyes of the onlookers. It seemed that Big Daddy was one of Sam's former playthings, and when Henry spoke of surpassing oneself, Big Daddy let go of his grudge, and Sam let go of his fear, allowing them to recognize each other once again. Suddenly, Sam and Big Daddy vanished together. Henry held an urn of ashes, which he then poured into the sea. Clearly, before Sam's death, the origins of his fetish and his relationship with Big Daddy were explained, providing a more ceremonious conclusion than Theo's departure. The scene fast forwards to the year 1987 when Gino arrives at the hospital with flowers to visit his partner Patrick, who by that time is critically ill. Soon after, a doctor fully dressed in protective gear enters the ward and announces that Patrick is on the verge of blindness. As an AIDS patient, Patrick is not eligible for surgery. The dialogue here clearly indicates that Patrick is infected with AIDS. Upon hearing this, Gino is ready to argue with the doctor again, but Patrick stops him. At this point, Patrick just wants Gino to stay by his side. Later, Gino feeds Patrick an apple. It's clear to see that Patrick now has great difficulty even swallowing. He begins to arrange his affairs, intending to leave all his possessions to Gino after his death. After Gino leaves, Patrick suddenly feels discomfort. As he goes to find a nurse, he accidentally falls beside his bed. He then hears strange voices calling his name. His vision fading, he crawls into his wheelchair and heads to the hospital corridor, which gradually brightens at the end. His wife Barbara is waiting for him there. Barbara gently takes Patrick's hand, and they walk together toward the end of the corridor. She leads him to a New York street, to the scene of an angel's fall, where the investigating officer is none other than Patrick himself. It turns out this is the scene where Patrick first met Gino, who was initially attracted to the handsome Patrick and left his contact information after inquiring about the case. The scene switches to the police station, where Patrick and a colleague have just returned from a crime scene, the colleague's uniform covered in blood. While Patrick is helping his colleague wash off the blood, he is suddenly kissed by him. Their passionate encounter is inadvertently witnessed by another colleague. Patrick pushes the kisser away, shouting at him to get lost, and then explains to others outside that the advance was not welcomed. The scene changes again. Patrick stands reluctantly in front of an autopsy table, dissecting a body, with the Mai Tai killer Whiteley guiding him. Whiteley is dressed in Patrick's usual work attire, complete with a sidearm. Through their conversation, it seems to suggest that in Patrick's mind, there are many similarities between himself and Whiteley. Perhaps Patrick harbors a desire to create a sentinel of his own. According to Barbara's explanation, Patrick is like a sentinel, made up of different parts pieced together, constantly being separated and reassembled. Barbara hopes that Patrick won't use this method to cover up the pain in his heart. The pain in Patrick's heart stems from his childhood, when his officer father from a family of police officers had high hopes for him. However, young Patrick could never handle a gun properly. His father constantly reprimanded him for his behaving like a girl, even going so far as to fire a gun next to his ear. This scene, like with Sam, serves to explain why Patrick has always kept himself hidden deeply in the closet. Afterwards, the scene shifts to Patrick's bedside, where Gino sits silently by his side. At the same time, he spots Barbara in the distance. At this point, Patrick can no longer differentiate between reality and hallucinations. Nearby, the bathhouse owner Kathy reappears to serenade a song. On the other side, Big Daddy also emerges in the hospital room. Surrounded by the song and the company of others, Patrick's heartbeat ceases. He passes away peacefully in the arms of his lover. The scene shifts back to the year 1981 once again. Adam restarts his detective work to investigate the cause of Theo's death. After Theo's funeral, he suddenly witnesses a body being carried out of an apartment on the street. Upon inquiring, he discovers that the body is none other than that of Dr. Hannah. Later, he enters Hannah's apartment and learns from the police that there were no signs of crime at Dr. Hannah's home. It appears she died there alone. The specific details await the results of an autopsy. 
After the police depart, Adam notices several tapes on a table. He starts playing the recordings, which reveal Dr. Hannah's notes about the previously decimated deer population on Fire Island suddenly starting to breed prolifically again, although she doesn't understand why. At this moment, Big Daddy appears behind Adam once more. That night, Adam carefully reviews Dr. Hannah's tapes. In the recordings, Hannah continually emphasizes the term T-cell lymphoma, and one can also hear her painful coughing before the recording stops abruptly. Adam plays this recording for the coroner, seeking to know if something happened to Dr. Hannah before her death, whether it could actually be a murder, and if it might be connected to Theo's death. However, after listening, the coroner suggests that the sounds are more indicative of sudden heart failure, and most importantly, given the external appearance of Hannah's body, there are no signs of a struggle, so murder is unlikely. The coroner had also previously examined Theo's body and determined that the cause of death was severe pneumonia caused by a fungus. While such a fungus could typically be cleared by the body's immune system, Theo's condition may have been worsened by being bound for hours before his death, which could have led to oxygen deprivation and exacerbated the pneumonia. Additionally, the autopsy revealed controlled substances in Theo's body at the time of death. Therefore, combining all these factors, they concluded that these issues led to Theo's death. The coroner also emphasizes that there is no connection between the deaths of Theo and Hannah. Afterwards, Adam continues to study the other recordings by Dr. Hannah. This time, the recording is of Hannah recalling the process of how she became infected. The most crucial part turned out to be Adam's donated sperm. After Hannah became pregnant and had her health indicators tested, the results gradually began to mirror those of Adam and some other members of the gay community. Following this, Dr. Hannah hypothesized that the disease could be sexually transmitted. At that point, Adam realized that his own infection may have been due to sexual contact with others, and also suddenly thought that Big Daddy represented this very disease. It was then that Adam noticed sarcomas beginning to appear on his body. The next day, Adam went to the hospital and asked the doctor to extract tissue from the sarcomas for testing. Deep down, he already knew what the disease was, but needed the doctor's confirmation and for it to be officially recorded. Before leaving, Adam urged the doctor to spread the word about this new disease to raise public awareness. If the doctor had doubts, Adam advised waiting for the test results of the sarcomas, which would explain everything. Dr. Hannah's recordings continued, talking about the deer population on Fire Island. They were not the source of the virus. Hannah also began to entertain the conspiracy theory that Fran had mentioned, that the virus was intentionally spread by the U.S. government. However, how the virus transmitted from the deer to the gay community was something Dr. Hannah had not fully figured out. Armed with all this information, Adam began to print posters, as Dr. Hannah had suggested, urging the use of condoms during sexual activity, especially among LGBT groups. He then went to the Neptune bathhouse to find the owner, Kathy, who was already troubled by constantly having to disinfect and clean the bathhouse, but this still did not prevent the guests from getting sick. Adam quickly took out the posters, hoping Kathy would agree to display them, clarifying that he wasn't from the health department and that his only aim was to ensure more people stayed safe. On the other side, Kathy suddenly expressed melancholy, revealing that tonight would be her last performance because the place no longer felt safe and her time was ending. She told Adam that he was still young and should not always think about how to die but how to continue living. This was also a reminder to Adam to engage in more meaningful activities. Afterwards, Adam posted the posters in various places, and in the subway, he encountered the same madwoman as before. She was still rambling incoherently, and as she suddenly disappeared, Adam picked up a newspaper that had appeared beside him. The headline read that 41 homosexuals had contracted a rare cancer, a sign that the mysterious disease was starting to attract public attention. The screen shifts back to 1987, a time when society was deeply concerned with the newly named AIDS. After Patrick's death, Gino went to the pharmacy to get his medication, with Big Daddy ominously trailing behind him. Then came Patrick's funeral, where it was evident that Patrick's family greatly shunned Gino. Anger surged through Gino when he saw Patrick's closed casket. He impetuously opened it, insisting that everyone should see Patrick's face, witness the harsh reality of his illness, and confront the issue rather than conceal it. At that moment, Patrick's eyes suddenly opened, revealing that it was all Gino's illusion. It appears that Gino had lost his previous vigor. As everyone settled in their seats, Gino stepped up to speak, and just then, the room's lights began to flicker, and Big Daddy reappeared. What followed was a highly surreal montage where individuals started falling into pits dug by Big Daddy, symbolically succumbing to AIDS. 
Till now, we can certainly deduce that the deer symbolizes the virus, while Big Daddy is some sort of spirit that foreshadows the deaths of HIV victims. In this drama, he mainly served to purify the sins of people, just like those murders committed by the Mai Tai killer. Back to the story, Gino kept attending funerals, participating in protest marches, and publishing AIDS-related news in his paper. Yet, the number of infections continued to rise each year. Big Daddy evolved from wielding cold weapons to firing a machine gun, suggesting the virus's expansion from a slow spread to a rapid proliferation. Despite this, people's ignorance and pursuit of pleasure allowed the virus to spread unchecked. As the years passed, Gino's own illness worsened. He fought relentlessly against Big Daddy, the embodiment of disease, but ultimately he could not escape and lost his life. Adam, once a close friend, delivered the eulogy at Gino's funeral, which concludes this drama. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.